Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I sit down with Dave Rolf, CIO at Wedgwood Partners, an asset management firm focused on concentrated growth investing. We talk with Dave about his investment approach and process in finding growth stocks to hold for the long term. He explains the key things they look for when finding growth stocks that can compound and deliver returns over time. We also talk about some of his positions in the portfolio and the investment thesis around them. This is a good discussion with an investor who has decades of growth stock investing under his belt. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Wedgwood's Dave Rolf. Dave, hi. Thank you for joining us on this summer afternoon. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. We're going to talk about growth investing, uh, your investing philosophy at Wedgwood, your investing process, and how you go about selecting stocks for the clients that you have invested in your portfolios. Um, but I think to start, it would, be, it would be helpful for our audience to sort of hear and learn a little bit more about your background and how you got started is sort of focused on growth investing. Gotcha. Well, I was, um, I was very fortunate at a very young age to, um, to get exposed to um, the writings um, annual reports, client letters, et cetera, outside reading at a very young age. I had a, even back in college, this is back in 1984 in my first investments class, I had a professor who um, we started, this is at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. We started the, um, the Student Investment Trust, uh, an investing club. And it's, it's, it's still up and running after all these years. And this professor was influential to me in pointing me to outside reading. So outside of textbook reading at a very young age, I'm, you know, 23, 24 at the time, uh, I had my first exposure to the likes of Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham and T. Rowe Price and, and, and the greats of that era. And then I, and I started in the, in the investment industry, um, like a lot of folks, I started at a, at a brokerage firm, Payne Weber back in the day, and uh, I didn't last long. I wasn't a very good salesperson and uh, was married, kind of half starving. And then in early 1988, I had a huge break for, in my career. I joined uh, one of the big trust companies here in St. Louis. It, it was called Centair Trust. It's the old First National Bank of St. Louis. And shortly thereafter, another large bank bought it. Uh, named Boatman's. And so my CV says from 1988 to 1992, I was a, I was a portfolio manager at, at Boatman's Trust. But the key part of that was every portfolio manager at the trust company had carved out a handful, a, a half a dozen or so, fully discretionary equity accounts that you could do whatever you wanted with it. Um, and if you beat the S&P 500, you're eligible for a bonus on top of your salary. Uh, so at a very young age, I'm 25 at the time, I got on the investment clock, that daily investment clock that never stops. In addition to that, these two combined organizations did a huge custody business. Um, a lot of clients used outs outside managers. And so we had pre-internet, we actually had two full-time librarians filing annual reports, shareholder reports, client letters from some of the more notable investment management firms of, of the day. And so through all of this, I was, I was really attracted to those, those firms, those investors that were focused investors. Um, they seemed to be doing something different. Their performance numbers would, would speak for themselves. But interestingly enough, because they didn't own a lot of stocks and they tended to own them for a long period of time, they had time to write about stocks in their portfolio. And I learned so much from from reading. I mean, I sit on the shoulders of, of the greats. So that's where, uh, back in 1988, this um, this philosophy of, of ours of a combination of investing uh, in the classic tenets of growth company investing, investing in better of breed businesses, married to the classic tenets of value investing, value stock picking. 
And so simply what we do at Wedgwood is that we want to uh, build a portfolio of, a, of 20 different business models, companies that have exhibited excellent growth and outstanding profitability in the past. And we believe we can understand these businesses to discern if that's going to continue in the future. And then we try to be very intelligent uh, as much as we can to be reasonable about building these portfolios at reasonable valuations, if not cheap valuations. And then we tend to hold these stocks for a long period of time. We, we truly are long-term investors. Our portfolio turnover is typically 20 or 25% per year. But if you kind of, if you look at what I consider philosophical turnover, that is we sell a stock and we buy a brand new one, not just trimming and portfolio management. I mean, our portfolio is like five or 10% a year portfolio turnover of actually getting rid of a stock and buying a brand new stock. And that's what we've been doing. And then in 1992, I left a trust company. I came to Wedgwood Partners bringing this philosophy. And this is what we've been doing for the past 31 years at Wedgwood Partners. The books in the background sort of tipped me off to uh, your love for reading. Yeah. I, you, know, <laughs> you know, once you once you get into that habit, I mean, you, 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 you can't break it. Uh, there's this... Um, there's this great uh, line from Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner. It sounds a little arrogant, but, but it's not. And, and he often will state that he has never met any person that was uh, a success in any field that wasn't a constant reader, um, always trying to improve yourself. And uh, like I said, it's easy to sit on the, the shoulders of, of giants in the investment management business because there's so much literature there's so many books to dive into. Do you think being in St. Louis sort of is, has an advantage for you and your firm and, you, and your, and your you know, portfolio managers in, in the sense that you know, you're not in, in New York, or you're not on the West Coast, and you're not falling victim to groupthink or things like that? Like, is there something they, with, where you're located? Like, I think of, you know, I've, I mean, Buffett's in Omaha. I mean, you have uh, these other great investors that are, you know, outside of the major financial sort of areas in the country. And I'm just wondering if there's an advantage to that. Well, I think there's some pros and cons. And I, and I think the short answer is yes. Certainly, when you're surrounded by more people, uh, intelligent people, those contacts can help and you can get ideas. That's kind of the neat thing about managers that file 13 Fs. You know, it's kind of the same type of thing that you can kind of look over the shoulders of other great investors. But I think net net, it really does, it really does help us. Um, the one thing I've believe I've come to learn and understand about, you know, really outstanding invest investors, um, they, uh, they remind me of that phrase, uh, eagles don't flock and, uh, and to have an independent mindset, um, I think is a big tailwind, a, a big intellectual advantage, um, when, when you're a stock picker. You know, I have this other screen over here and it's all the symbols and it's green and red all day long. And uh, there's that other really great uh, aphorism, Maxim, that Buffett talks about. And that is um, the market, the stock market is there to serve you, not to instruct you. And if you can break away from this idea that if your stocks are down, that doesn't mean you're wrong or right, for that matter. If your stocks are up, the same thing applies. And so um, at Wedgwood, I've tried to take that idea of, of fewer cooks in the kitchen, having that independent mindset. My investment team is just um, two other individuals. And uh, again, it's a 20 stock portfolio. There's not a lot of turnover. And this idea that we can come in, a lot of shops do things a lot differently. I mean, our process is not built, Justin, that we need to come up with a bunch of ideas all of the time. In our opinion, they don't exist. We don't come in here every Monday morning, do a, do a sophisticated computer screen, and that screen spits out a bunch of names that we should take a look at. And so again, it's, it's um, you know, we, we humbly su uh, suggest, and we try to build that into our, our investment process. We're simply trying to make fewer decisions, but more impactful decisions and if you truly are a long-term investor, um, you have to take the good with the bad when the market's going against you. But if you can conquer that, I, that that's pro probably more than half the battle to beat the uh, 
to beat the market, to beat the S and P 500, and to and to beat your peers. Since you've been growth investing for a few decades now, I wanted to ask you how it's changed over time. Like when you look back at the beginning of your career and how you invested and how it works today, I mean, is it pretty much the same principles carry all the way across, or do you think growth investing has evolved a lot over time? Um, I think it's been pretty much the same, but the players on the field have changed. And what I mean by that, and then and then I want to talk about uh, interest rates. Remind me if I if, if I forget. But it's really interesting if you look at um, if you look at our portfolio, most of the companies in our portfolio, to look at kind of two extremes, uh, certainly they're growth companies, uh, and most of them are part and parcel of, say, the Russell 1000 growth index. And we don't have too many in the Russell 1000 value index. But what's interesting, and again, and we traffic in the large cap area, if you look at the top 20, 25 holdings um, of the Russell 1000 value index back in the day over the past 30 years it's been rare that we didn't consider owning or we did own some of these big value companies when 10 15 20 years ago they were they were very growthy uh companies you know we're talking about you know stocks up you know procter and gamble general mills some oil companies um but one of the problems with growth investing is that growth at a decent rate of return can't continue forever. You know, you hit those, you know, the law of large numbers. And so the, the, the players have changed, but the philosophy behind that hasn't. And also what has been a huge tailwind for us at Wedgwood and specifically for me in my career, think of where say the 10 year bond yield was back in 1986, 1987, when I got into this business. You know, for the for 35 years, um, I've largely had a career where interest rates were falling. Um, you know, they kind of went like this. Now they popped up of late from zero. They couldn't go well. I guess in Europe they did go lower than zero, but I've had this massive tailwind of lower interest rates. And so you think about the effect of what that has on valuations. Um, growth companies tend to be longer duration assets. Everything else being equal, when rates fall, those stock prices are going to go up at a higher rate than a stock that might be considered maybe lower growth, lower, lower duration, et cetera. And I think one of the challenges of, of growth investors over the past couple of decades is um, at what point will you hold a stock because you'll say to yourself, well, interest rates are lower. I should be able to buy it at a higher valuation than I would maybe 10 years ago. Uh, everything else being equal, or at least hold on to it. But the trick is, when we have so much money in the market these days and everybody chasing performance, just because interest rates are low doesn't mean that that asset has appreciated or the stock has appreciated to incorporate those lower valuations so that the future return is very, very low. And that's the trick. Um, to sell when the valuation, again, it's that old saying, maybe a great company, but it's a lousy stock because everything is in the price and more. And I think we're seeing some of that right now in, in big cap tech, uh, given the unbelievable performance of a handful of these uh, large cap technology stocks. So the game really hasn't changed. The players have changed. But I think the backdrop of, of, um, of the significant changes of interest rates over the past 30 years has uh, has been difficult for managers to adapt to that. I want to pick up on that valuation idea. If you look at the overall growth universe, are you having a harder time now? Like a lot of people say, you know, because growth companies have gone up so much relative to value, they're more expensive as a group than they have been historically. Are you having a harder time finding good growth companies in the current universe? Or, or you can always find good growth companies, even, you know, in an overvalued universe, maybe? Well, that's a great question. I mean, th thank goodness we only build a portfolio of 20 stocks. Because <laughs> when the market when the market is heady, yeah, I mean you can find the companies, but at what price? Again, it's unless you're talking of back in 08 or 09 or other periods where the where the market is corrected sharply. You know, if if the if the three of us were an investment management team, and let's say that our typical portfolio had you know 40 stocks, 50 stocks, I mean, 
think about how difficult it would be. I mean, is there, except in bear markets, is there really such a thing of our 41st great idea? I, I, the market's pretty <laughs> efficient, particularly in the large cap space. I mean, you know, we've owned Apple since 2005. You know, what's our edge on Apple? It's probably one of the most widely followed stocks out there. I mean, my, my you know, 85-year-old mother will ask me, hey, how was Apple's earnings? You know, I mean, everybody follows Apple. Um, so you have to have a, a, a dip, maybe a differentiated approach or, to, or to, you know, to weight some of these stocks at higher weightings in your portfolio, much higher than your peer group and, 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 and the benchmark. But again, we're only looking for the 20 stock portfolio. We're looking for one or two compelling new ideas in any given year. Uh, I think the hardest thing that we have to deal with is when the market's pretty heady and, um, the market will simply take away a stock in the portfolio that I wish it wouldn't take away. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this is this is pre-split. We owned Nvidia. We bought it at 175, and we added to it a little bit. And our final sale was at 555 dollars a share. Again, this is pre-split of of where it is today. And I didn't want to get rid of this great business, but at the time we thought um, the valuation is just too high. It went through a correction. Um, our mistake has been that we didn't get back in uh, when, this, when the shares, they weren't as cheap as when we first bought it, but it corrected, it, it corrected pretty hard and we, didn't, and we didn't get back in. And you can see what the stock has done of late. If we were in the stock, we wouldn't have ridden it all the way to where it is now, where the valuation seems to be um, in, priced in or embedding unbelievable growth for the next five and 10 years. I want to dig into your process because you have a really interesting four-step process you guys look at to find great companies. And, and the first part of that process is finding a dominant product or service. And that, that's interesting to me because you would think, you know, on one hand, a lot of dominant products and services don't end up remaining dominant. But then on the other hand, some of the really great businesses, they start as a dominant product and they're able to maintain it. And I'm just wondering, how do you think about distinguishing between those two? Well, I, the, second, the, the second part of your question, I think is key. This idea that it can be uh, it can continue to be dominant. So let's take that question and think of in terms of, of numbers, specifically profitability. If a company has, in our opinion, um, um, a dominant product or service, and they should have maybe they should have some pricing power. In addition to that, any company that has a dominant product or service, there's probably a bunch of competitors trying to emulate that. And that's where you really can separate this idea of a terrific company that has these sustainable competitive advantages. And our North Star at Wedgwood is return on capital, either return on capital, return on equity, return on assets, cash flow, uh, return on invested capital, those type of measures that if, if, if a, a service or product is truly dominant and management can navigate those competitive waters um, and battles, that product or the company should be able to maintain high levels of profitability. So that's, that's where we're really looking for first is those companies that have been able to, to generate these high levels, consistently high levels of profitability. And so to us, that type of metric over a meaningful period of time is prima facie evidence of some type of significant competitive advantage. Now, it's our job as analysts to figure out, well, do we understand what these terrific companies have done in the past? But more importantly, do we think it can continue and for how long? So that's kind of the analytic journey of our universe. And we're trying to crunch that universe down to, say, 35 or 40 companies really quick. And that's, that's our playing field. And then we build a 20 stock portfolio out of that. But the key, the key is, is, um, is, is profitability. And we, and again, to state it another way, profitability, either high, high, mediocre, or low is the mother's milk of future earnings growth. So everything else being equal, high profitability generates a lot of cash. Companies may often be paying a dividend, but they still have all of this retained earnings. And if you're a long-term investor, now you're thinking about this idea. And this is another thing that we check when we're analyzing a company for uh, inclusion in the portfolio and ongoing analysis. If you think about what, what growth companies have a big problem is that they're gonna generate a lot of cash. 
They typically don't pay it all out. So over the course of time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, retained earnings are going to be built up a lot. And so now you got to ask yourself a question. Is the C-suite, are they good capital allocators? Do they reinvest in their business if they have opportunities? If products or services are starting to wane and the, and the competitive landscape is shifting, are they going to go buy a company, develop, develop on, on its own? Um, all of that will flow through to future profitability. And that's probably where uh, I would think the best investors have a really good grasp is that they have some idea, some clarity on what those retained earnings today are going to generate in future profitability. Um, and that, again, that's the definition of, of, a, of, of a growth company. And it's hard to do. And there aren't many out there. And that's why we don't try to look for 40 of them, just about 20 of them. One of the other interesting criteria you had was this a sustainable and consistent level of growing revenues, earnings, and dividends. And, and what struck me about that is dividends, because you typically won't see growth investors talking about dividends very often. So can you just talk about how, how you think about growth in, in that context? Yeah, great question. Again, um, there are companies in our portfolio that don't pay dividends. But over the fullest of time, if those retained earnings are getting so high, um, and again, and we, it's rare that companies can grow for a long period of time by making acquisitions. In a, in a, comp in a competitive auction, the seller usually wins, the buyer doesn't. And uh, ultimately, the best use of, of, of capital is that when you don't have uh, reinvestment opportunities and you're very disciplined and not just spending money and, and, or using your shares or cash to make acquisition because Wall Street loves that kind of stuff. Apple's a good example. Back, back in, um, in, in 2012, they started to return capital and size back to shareholders and huge buybacks as well as dividends. And, um, and growing dividends also, again, for a long-term investor, um, it's not so much what the current yield is today, but what's really interesting is if you hold a stock long enough and those dividends continue to rise, and then there's this really neat metric that we love to look at for some of it, like, like Apple. If we look at our dividend yield to cost. And so for those clients that have been with us, that were with us back in 2005, um, Apple over the years has paid a relatively modest dividend, but they've increased it over the years. Now, based on our original cost in Apple, our dividend yield to cost is in excess of 35%. So those clients are getting back 35% of their invested capital every year just through dividends. And when you marry that, again, that implies growth, um, earnings growth, share price, dividend growth, all of those good things. So we're not necessarily looking at dividend yield primarily, but it's a, it's a byproduct of, of of rational capital management when companies have to start returning capital to shareholders. Um, we, we would prefer share buybacks if they can do that in an accretive manner, accretive manner. Most companies can't. And I think a growing dividend is also a signal to the marketplace of uh, management's intention of the rate of future growth as they increase that dividend every year. So again, it's, it's not a big criteria, an initial criteria, but if we're right, it's a nice it's a nice afterthought, if you will. It's a nice result of things going the right way. How do you think about debt? Your third criteria was a high level of profitability without the use of excessive debt. It seems like in some cases, you know, debt can be great to help boost growth for a growth company. But if you take it too far, it can be a huge problem. So how do you think about the use of debt by growth companies? Yeah, I think that's where in terms of capital management um, and, and, you know, and maybe you can put away your corporate finance books. That's, I think, where where uh, there's a science to it. Um, certainly there's an, an accounting leverage element. There's also a craft to it. A little bit of inexpensive debt can go a long way. But wh wh where, do you get to, where do you get to that point that you have too much debt? And you're not to belabor the same stock, but you know Apple has taken on a lot of debt when it was really cheap um, to buy back stock. Um, it helps, that mean, it, it enhances their cash flow generation. And so the usage of debt 
can be intelligent, but everything else being equal, we don't want to get close to the goal line here or out of bounds line in our companies that have, um, the last thing we want to hear a company say is that, oh, we had a chance to make an acquisition or we had a chance to spend a lot of money on R&D into a new product area that we think would be great, but we had too much debt and we couldn't do it. Now, the management's probably not going to be that blunt, but a little bit goes a long way. We would prefer less than, um, than more. You mentioned the fourth criteria is a strong management team, and you mentioned that management has to be great capital allocators, but I'm wondering if there's anything else besides that that you look for in judging a great management team. Well, I mean, everything else being equal, we'd like to have management um, own a lot of shares, so they're eating their own cooking. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they have a significant part of their wealth in the companies in which, in which they manage. Um, again, the capital allocation uh, question is key. Uh, you can go back over the years and look at past transcripts to hear how management, their theory of capital allocation, also shareholder letters, investor presentations, and see how they've done in, 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 doing, in doing just that. We also like everything else being equal. We would prefer to have management teams be compensated, not in just the raw underlying growth of, of sales or earnings, but we really like to see um, uh, you know, share-based compensation bonuses based on levels of profitability, just not raw growth. And, and, I, and unfortunately, we've seen that time and time again where the C-suite is rewarded for the size of their business. And when they go in front of their compensation committees and consultants, it's like, hey, well, you know, we used to be, you know, one-tenth of the size of Procter & Gamble, and now we're you know, half the size of Procter & Gamble because we've made all these other acquisitions. So our pay should be commensurate at this level of the size of the organization. Um, that works well. But it, again, incentives matter. And you can see where the incentives can get out of hand. That's probably where we've been burned the most over the years is, uh, is companies who have um, tried to grow uh, too fast and they've made some poor acquisitions and all of the projections and everything at the outset of an acquisition don't come close to bearing to, to bearing out. And, um, and so we've, we've been burned in the past on that. So we're very leery of that. You mentioned valuation before, and I'd assume once you, once you apply these other criteria and you've determined, you've determined you've got a really good business here, you probably need to look at valuation. How do you think about that? Do you use standard metrics? Are you doing a discounted cash flow analysis? Like how, how do you think about determining whether the price you're paying is fair? We, everything you mentioned, we use. It's, it's a mosaic. Again, I think valuation, at least in our minds, is much more art than science. Um, companies, their business models change, and so historic valuations may not um, make a lot of sense. Again, take Apple as an example. Um, back in 2013, their services business had a, a, a revenue run rate of about $13 billion. This year, it should be about $80 billion but it has gross margins of 71% as compared to the gross margins of their hardware division, which is still huge, of about 35 or 36%. So that 80 billion run rate should have a very different valuation than a hardware business. And we, we've seen that in the stock. We have to take interest rates into consideration. Um, you know, some we, in the past we've owned banks. So, uh, you know, price to book matters. Um, some businesses, you know, we we uh, we owned Berkshire Hathaway for 20 years. We sold it in 2018, and so it was book value, also their operating earnings, but also there was a sum of some of the parts. I mean, they had this big equity portfolio. They have cash. Uh, they got this. You know, how do you value float, low cost float, when low cost float? Well, any float is a liability, but low cost float has qualities of equity. So how do you think about that? So. It's all of the standard metrics that you, that all investors use, but with our experience, hopefully we can bring our experience to bear uh, which valuations are the, are, the, are the most critical given the underlying business model we're looking at. I have to admit, I'm kind of a sucker for a good reverse triangle, and you, you've got a really good one on your website where you kind of go through your, yeah, you know, where you start with your investment universe and work through to your research universe and then to your Wedgwood universe and then all the way at the bottom to your focus yeah. portfolios. And I'm just wondering, like, in light of the criteria we talked about already, can you sort of talk about that process of working from the top of 
you know, defining your universe all the way down to when you end up with your focus portfolio? Sure. I mean, our universe starts, it's, 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 you know, the, the broad, large cap universe, depending on what indice you, you want to look at, you know, it's 500 plus stocks and getting back to this idea that's paramount in our minds. Again, it's our North star. It's high levels of profitability. So if you're looking for industry leading profitability, um, outstanding profitability without a lot of debt, just in your mind's eye, you can kind of think that, well, if we have whatever our universe might be, we could probably eliminate 85 to 90% of our universe really quickly. And that's been our experience. And there's also some industries that we've never owned a utility stock. I mean, so, you know, sometimes those, those bring the numbers down. But we can, co- we can collapse a universe pretty darn quick to 40 or 50 stocks on this idea of high levels of profitability, which have generated maybe double digit growth in revenues and earnings per share. That list collapse collapses pretty quickly. And, uh, and so that's when we start digging in for some of the, some of the analysis that I've o- already spoke to. So again, um, I think that's a competitive advantage of a focused investor that embraces long-term investing. Again, you kind of re- revert that thought process. And what you get is our process is not designed to spit out a bunch of new ideas all the time. Uh, we just don't think they exist. And again, you have to try to go down that path. You know, just think about the, the if we had a 50 stock portfolio with 100% turnover, Think about, I mean, we would be on the new idea treadmill all day long as an investment team. We probably would need double or triple of the size of our current team. And so uh, um, our culture here is a key part of that triangle that we all, you know, the, the three of us buy into this idea. Less is more, fewer ideas. Let's be very patient. Let's try to swing a big fat when valuation uh, makes sense. Uh, and, if, and there are a lot of times that, we're just not going to do anything. And that's okay, too. So as a team, we have to buy into that. I mean, that's the culture here at, at Wedgwood. But, it, you know, all of our activity, our discussion, portfolio management, revolves around the very bottom of that in, uh, inverted pyramid, a, as you described. Yeah, we've had previous guests talk about this the idea of a research graveyard. And it seems like that applies pretty well to you, too. Like, it seems like you look into a lot of stuff for every one thing you actually do seems like you're doing a lot of research just to get to a very small number of ideas. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, if, if the valuation is too high, we still may keep an eye on the company. A lot of companies are, well, in our estimation, they've seen their better growth years in the past. Um, there are other companies that we also have to kind of have a, a, an ego check that as long as we've been doing this, you know, are we going to have any edge of our, in our thinking, looking at early stage biotech companies? I mean, sometimes they're just too hard that reduces the list as well. And so, um, you get all of those things contribute to this idea that less is more. Do you have any quantitative parts to your process? So will you do like some initial screens to get companies for you to look into further? From time to time, um, we'll do that again. Not too much. Again, this, when we're following a company or owning a, and there's been a number of companies over the years that we have followed for a long time and we've never pulled the trigger. So when we follow these companies, obviously we're trying to figure out who their competitive competitors are, what, the, what does their profitability look like. And so it's not, it's not um, a quantitative screening, but just through our qualitative analysis, we're, we're kind of doing screening ourselves um, of competitors like companies, new entrants into a, into a marketplace, that type of thing. One of the things those of us like in the quantitative space have been dealing with a lot is this idea of there's many more intangible assets in the economy now than there used to be. So we, we used to, the economy used to be dominated by all the companies with tons of tangible assets. Now it's dominated by companies with lots of intangible assets. Does that change any way, in any way the way you think about growth investing? Does it change your process in any way? Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a very important key idea. I was looking for the right verbiage. Well, take, take for example, one of, one of our larger holdings. Um, Meta platforms. So they just launched th- threads uh, about six days ago, and there are over 100 million users. I, I mean, um, the intangible asset, the value of, of um, I mean, can you imagine if the three of us owned a grocery store and we had 2 billion 
people come through our doors every month. I mean, it, it's stunning. And, and so the, some of these technology companies, uh, even if you compare them to the silly valuations back in 1999 and, and early 2000, maybe even in 1998, very few companies had then had this type of global um, size, scope, and scale. Um, that doesn't diminish some of the some of the the valuation issues that we may, you know, on a company by company basis. But 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 just think of that of that stat. I remember when you know when TikTok burst on the scene and you'd see all the you know look look how many users TikTok got and then recently look how many users Chat GPT got. You know this threads have smoked them all. Hundred million users in a week? Are you kidding me? Now we'll see if they stay. I mean there's work to be done, but. Um, you know, just think about that intangible asset of the of the global daily and monthly users that Meta has, Facebook has. It's it's astonishing, and uh, yeah, you, um, and, yeah. and so I hope that answers your questions or at least addresses it. No, it does. Yeah, Justin and I are actually both up on Threads now. We're we're longtime Twitter users, and we we both kind of started the new Threads accounts to see uh to see what happens there. Well, and and supposedly the word on the street is they built that with twenty developers and like. I think like maybe three to six months or something like that. I mean, it doesn't have all the functionality that Twitter has, but right. it, it wasn't like this massive long build um, and, you know, hundreds of developers working on it. Yeah. I mean, obviously, obviously they had the um, Instagram and the captive, you know, the, the hundreds of millions and billions of users already to grow it, but, you know, it wasn't a big development lift. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe uh, when Zuckerberg over the past year or so has said, hey, we're going to, slow down hiring, and then we're going to fire a lot of people. And we're going to try to be able to get through projects and get rid of all of the, you know, the get back to the inertia of having our best people get the best work done. You know, that kind of speaks to that, that a handful of developers could knock this out in a short period of time. Stuff like that doesn't happen in a committee of 50 people, at least not that fast. Yeah, I was thinking about what Threads is worth. I mean, if Threads had been a startup company and it launched like this with this many users, it would be worth an enormous amount of money. So it's amazing the amount of value they've created like in, in a very short period of time. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and another, another thought on Meta, which is interesting, is that, you know, look at what they've developed in, in-house. And even if they wanted to go out and, you know, they, you know, they bought WhatsApp and Instagram real cheap years ago, but I don't think the FTC would let them make a sizable uh, acquisition, so they're forced to do it in house, which there's a lot of bet, you know, there's a lot of benefits to that, and um, and just that regulatory overhang um, that is that they deal with all the time now. Um, to me, it's a competitive advantage. I mean, who who would who would want to try to compete with them with the the size that they have and the lawyers they have and the fights they've already been through. It's uh, um, we we have a little we have a little joke here at, at Wedgwood is that we're not doing good work to identify really dominant companies unless they've been sued by the FTC. Speaking of of, of technology, how do you think about sector concentration? You know, are you willing to over concentrate in certain sectors if you see a lot of growth there, or do you have some limits in terms of where you'll go? Well, a key part of our diversification is is uh, we don't mind being really crowded in a certain sector as long as the business models are very different. So if you look at our, some of our top holdings is, is, you know, Apple, Meta, and Google, there's obviously overlap ad spending between uh, Alphabet and, uh, and Meta, but Apple couldn't be a, more of a different company than Meta. And they're both, and they're both tech companies. And so that's, that's a key part of this idea of diversifying uh, with unlike business models. That's the reason why, We've owned Visa for many years, but we've never owned MasterCard. The business models are just too similar. If we're right on one, we're probably going to be right on the other one. So why not just overweight one and free up space for another name in the portfolio? Um, you know, it's, 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 that kind of, it's that kind of thinking. How about position sizing? If you have a high conviction name, how big of a portion of the portfolio do you allow it to be? We, 10%. We start trimming. I mean, we, 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 recently tri trimmed Meta because it, it hit 10%. So that's been, that's been a long held um, a limit that we've communicated to clients over the past few decades is, you know, we're focused, but we're not gonna go nuts. And so every time over, you know, every time we've had to trim Apple because it's hit that 
In hindsight, it's been a mistake, but that is a limit to how large we'll let a position run. And related to that, our top 10 holdings typically represent two thirds or 70% of our portfolio. So when you really kind of dive down into the numbers, um, we, it's, it's 10 stocks that are probably going to drive the bulk of our any outperformance or unfortunately some years underperformance in our portfolio. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of um, at both last year and this year's Berkshire uh, shareholder meeting, Buffett and Munger talked about how you know a handful of ideas have been the big drivers of their returns and, and success. And I think what's, you know, what's prompted that to some extent is how big Apple is in the portfolio today in terms of the equity position for Berkshire. So, but do you, I, I'm guessing just given how your portfolio is weighted, the same is mostly true for you in the sense that of those top positions, you know, probably a small number of them are the big drivers of return, returns. Would you say that, that that's sort of a true statement or is that? No, that, 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 that absolutely is a true statement. One of, the, one of the other elements that we look for in the construction of our portfolio, which has been challenging over the past few years, is um, we used to demand, and I'll fast forward up where it's been challenging of, of late. We demand that every stock in the portfolio has a higher weight than its underlying weighting, let's say, in the S&P 500. And for most stocks, significantly higher. So if you kind of do the math on that, um, I mean, we're bullish on a stock. Why have it at a benchmark weight? I mean, if we're right and it goes up, it doesn't help us. If we're wrong and it goes down, it doesn't hurt us. We're active managers. So it's a high conviction portfolio. And some of our biggest drivers over the years have been companies that are kind of well, they don't dominate. I mean, they're not the absolutely largest capitalization weighted, capitalization size stocks in our, in our portfolio. Getting back to this idea on how challenging that's been in, over the past couple of years is, um, you know, Apple is a, is a significant holding. I mean, it's right. It's our second largest holding right now. But in terms of Apple's weighting in the S&P 500, it's probably one of our least significant conviction ideas, if you will, in that the weighting is not significantly higher than, uh, um, I mean, typically our stock, we may have double the weighting. You know, so if, if Apple is a 7% 7 weighting in the S&P or say 6% and our weighting is 7 or 8, we're not that much higher than, um, than the benchmark. Now, that, that's been the reality of trillion dollar market cap companies that have burst, that burst on the scene, but have gotten to this point over the past half, half dozen years. And so, and so rare exception, Microsoft is an exception to the rule. We, recent, uh, we recently trimmed Microsoft um, because we were concerned about the valuation. And so Microsoft is, is even a little bit underweighted versus, versus the S&P 500. And we're hope to get an opportunity to add to that. But think about Think about what it means when a manager has a stock that's underweighted versus the benchmark. The only way that stock can help your performance on a relative basis is if the stock falls. If Microsoft from here would boom, now nominally, we're going to gain as well. But relative to the benchmark, we're going to underperform. Um, I think that's probably one of the key competitive advantages of a focused uh, portfolio while a number of our peers will share quite a few of the same holdings, but typically because we're only investing in 20 stocks and most of the portfolio in just 10, our weightings in the same stocks are often significantly greater than that of our peer group or um, say the S&P 500. You mentioned that you know there's not a lot of turnover in the portfolio, but I am curious of the sell process. Would you say that you're... Historically, you mostly sell because the company fails on those four criteria we talked about earlier. There starts to be deterioration in its competitive advantage and its growth efforts. Or could you also sell because there's an opportunity cost thing where you're like, okay, this is the 20th position, the one we have the least conviction on. There's this great opportunity out here. 
we want to now add that position to the portfolio. And so would you turn around and sell one of your positions to get a new position in? Maybe you don't do that, but I'm just curious if you could talk about your sell criteria. Yeah. Well, second part of your question. Yeah, we do that. And we think about that a lot. Our, our sell criteria uh, in no particular order. Um, first part of your question, um, the growth that we thought was there doesn't come about. Um, the worst ones are we invest in something and, and it hits that growth wall, that brick wall sooner than we thought. Uh, those, those, th those, those sting. Related to that are those companies we've owned for quite a few years. The growth is slowing down, but it's slowing down at a rate that's so it's not problematic for us. Maybe it's a high double digit grower and now it's slowly getting to maybe a, a low double digit grower. The ones that really hurt is when it hits that growth wall. And that's, those are the ones that sting because I mean, we should have been able to pick that up. Um, but related to that also is if we look at our biggest mistakes over the years, and I don't know how much time you have in your podcast for this. I should have a, 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 a slide in our pitch book on this. It also, it also educates us that we often were pretty good at that of something we think is problematic in the growth algorithm of a company. We sell and we avoid a slowdown. And we think, oh, look how smart we are. But if the company's pretty darn good to begin with, it's not as challenging to return to growth, fix that growth problem than if it's a lousy business. And I can't tell you how much money we've left on the table over the years of not getting back into these terrific companies where maybe short term we made a good call and we don't get back in for whatever reason. You know, we didn't have room in the portfolio or whatever. And, you know, management fixes the problem and off to the races and off to the races they go. The other issue, and then of course there's valuation. When valuation gets high, we're trimming. When it gets to be nine or 10% of the portfolio, we're trimming. In the case where valuation just gets too extreme, the stock's taken away from us. Mr. Market takes it away from us. And that's another reason to sell. But it, but the second part of your question, I think is the one that we spend a lot of time is that, you know, when, when a stock is one of our least convicted ideas, it's probably one of our smaller holdings. And if we find a better idea that we want to get into the portfolio, better growth, maybe better valuation, a combination of the two, we also take our time on that decision as well. Because that's where, you know, the, again, science and art become a craft. The new idea in our collective minds has to be significantly better than our least convicted idea in the portfolio, and then we'll make that swap. So those are the elements of why we would exit a position. Yeah, I think uh, Meta might be a good example of like, if you, you could have seen why investors may have gotten out of that you know, a year and a half, a year ago, whenever they were going, they had the regulatory stuff, they had the operate, they had the operational issues, they had the metaverse, investors were yeah. questioning, you know, what's going on over there, Zuckerberg owns, you know, a significant part of the different voting shares, and there was concerns about that. But I think like, they're sort of looking, looks like they're returning to better growth days ahead. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. Um, when you look back to where consensus expectations for earnings were, say for this year and then and then in 2024, when you go back to the to the to the early early 22, 2022, and the say the spring of 2022, consensus expectations are already back to where those levels were. And we know they had those two horrible quarters where Zuckerberg basically said, hey, you know, we got TikTok comp competition. We probably have, we have we have an ad recession in some of our verticals. And oh, by the way, we're such believers in the metaverse. We changed the name of the company and we're going to spend as much money as I feel like it. And they did that two quarters in a row. Um, but even within those conference calls, you started to see some of those earlier problems starting. to They, had, they were addressing them. AI was uh, uh, was really doing wonders in terms of in terms of new ad spending, um, the quarter they mentioned in TikTok about five or six times. And I also, and we also wondered, you know, they entered 20, they, they entered calendar 2022 with the FTC looking at them. 
So they probably had FTC lawyers on site. And so all of a sudden it's like, oh, here's this, you know, we got to regulate this monopoly even more. And then here comes the quarter, TikTok, 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 TikTok. Like, no, 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 we got all, we got all kinds of competition. I don't think the next quarter they even mentioned TikTok. But, but the overriding thought that we had, WhatsApp and these other things were still doing really, really well. Um, however, the big problem that crushed estimates was utterly in the control of Zuckerberg. He just had to stop spending so much. And, you know, he's no dummy. He saw what happened to the stock. I'm sure every, every employee that he sees in, in every meeting and in the hall is like, Mark, when's the stock going to stop falling? And so he reversed course. And so that probably was one of the best decisions we've made over the past 10 or 15 years is that we didn't sell Meta when you could kind of step back from a, a thousand foot view and say, this stock is demanding to be sold because the thesis has changed. But we didn't think the thesis was really changed. It was evolving. Yeah, that was one of the things I missed about these great growth companies is all of them had the ability to significantly cut costs without affecting their business. Like they all right. have too many employees. And so they've been able to, you know, increase cash flows without really impacting their business at all with a lot of these cuts they made. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that's a great point. And, and I think that's an, another reason why or related to that. Uh, the, the kind of the immunity of these businesses that that have growth, they generate so much darn profitability. Um, so when, the, you know, when the Fed's tightening, uh, some parts of the economy are slowing down. Um, investors as a whole looked at these companies and said, you know, these these are global giants. They're largely immune from some of this domestic macro stuff. Um, and the next thing you know, they're viewed as safe havens to a certain extent. Um, and boom, off to the races they went in terms of their valuations. I think a number of them have gone too far, but um, it, it was interesting when there, we kind of had these rolling weaknesses in, in the U.S. economy as these uh, as the Fed policy, the inverted yield curve with their with the lag effects was kind of starting to bite certain industries, and uh, and they just motored right ahead. You had mentioned consensus earnings estimates, and I, I'm just curious because I'm sure you. Been looking at been looking at consensus estimates probably your whole career. Um, are with these mega cap tech companies? I mean, does Wall Street for the most part get the earnings? Most you know, is it pretty highly accurate? Because I mean, a lot of these companies have like thirty or forty analysts covering them, maybe even more. So I'm wondering if you get you know all these estimates in, have, do you find that they're pretty pretty accurate over time? Yeah, I, I think they. Over the, over the sweep of history, over the sweep of time, I think they are incredibly accurate. But I also have to recognize is that most of these big tech uh, companies or just, just not, not even big, just most widely followed big companies, they give guidance. And um, if management is, is decent in managing, they probably have a pretty good idea of what the next quarter is going gonna, is gonna to look like. And it always, I, even to this day, I get a, I get chuckles. I chuckle when to myself when I see these uh, reports that says, "Oh, you know, um, first quarter earnings in 2023 um, um, exceeded expectations by about five percent." Uh, well, it's it's corporate management that's setting those. And so there's <laughs> right. certainly, yeah. there certainly is an element within consensus, the the the, the business of cons, of compiling consensus expectations that. It, Certainly, there's analysis that are that's going into that, but it's also just reporting. They're reporting and reflecting what management has said. You go back to Meta; uh, those consensus expectations collapsed because Zuckerberg said we're going to spend like drunken sailors. You know, so you take the hatchet to it. Um, so, what I think is really impressive for companies, say like like Berkshire Hathaway, that Buffett doesn't give expectations. Now, it's, it's not widely followed. Um, but there are a handful of analysts, when, when, they're an, when their numbers come in pretty tight, to me that's pretty impressive because they're not giving any, any guidance. They're doing it all themselves. And that's a, pretty good, uh, that, that's a that's pretty good analysis when you can pull that off. Just a couple more here, and then we'll let you go. We really appreciate all the time today. Uh, um, wanted to sort of pivot to just uh, sort of like some macro stuff. So do you... Do you 
Think about inflation or other macro-related issues. I mean, you're clearly bottoms up stock pickers. That's pretty clear. Anybody that's listened to this so far know that these guys are bottoms up. But I'm just wondering, do you, does, does any top-down stuff come in to the process? Only at an industry level. And so, you know, we own, we own Alphabet um, and Meta. We need to have an idea on what ad spending is going to look like. When we're seeing weakness, let's say in healthcare, or we were seeing weakness in banks, and we've seen that this year. Well, it's safe to say that ad spending in those verticals is going to flow through in a negative way to these companies. And so, again, it's we're looking at macro data as it pertains probably to that industry-specific macro and and what ultimately, I mean, I don't care what kind of company you are, you can't outmanage forever the macro elements within your own industry. And so that's where we, 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 we tend to have a view of, but it's not anywhere top down to think that, oh, you know, the Fed's not going to get to their target of 2%. Let's, and the economy's going to slow because they keep on tightening. We need to increase our weighting and consumer staples because we think the, right. the economy as a whole may uh, downshift in, in the second half of 2024. We, we've, we've never played that, that uh, we've never used economic data, broad macro uh, 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 economic data to drive uh, uh, industry weightings or anything like that. Coming into last year, so coming into 2021, you know, there was a lot of comparisons to the market, specifically like technology names and growth names to the 2000 to two, 99 to 2000, let's say two market. And then, then the bear market started. No, the bear market started in 2000, excuse me. Um, so, but then we had last year and obviously a lot of those highly overvalued companies got whacked. And I don't, I don't really know if they've come back. I think some of them have recently. Have, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But I'm just wondering, like, when you think of those two periods of time, like how would you compare and contrast those periods? I think, um, I think, um, you know, 19, you know, late 1999, certainly into early 2000. Um, I think that was a one act play. Um, when you look back at some of the stock charts back in that, you know, you know, established companies like Cisco and Microsoft, others, uh, whatever dot com company you wanted to look at, a lot of them peaked in a relatively short period of time. I think if you fast forward to what we just experienced, and I think what you how you laid out the question speaks to this. Some of these profitless, uh, you know, the some of these companies that um, were huge beneficiaries of the pandemic, recent IPOs, that was, hey, you know, let's get as much sales as we can. You know, everybody, what's your TAM? Oh, the TAM's growing bigger, so bid up the stock. You know, total addressable market and that stuff. And, we're, and we'll worry about profitability sometime in the future. Most of those peaked in early 2020. Um, I think the broad market, peaked. I think the S&P 500 peaked in early, early December um, of 2021, you know, as a precursor to a tough 2022. So I think, I think it was a two act play. I think the stuff, the go-go stuff peaked uh, much earlier than the broad market. Um, and those stocks, a lot of them got hit just as hard as I mean, what, the NASDAQ was down with what, 83% um, from 2000. A, a lot of those stocks got hit hard, you know, the darlings of just a couple of years ago, and some have come back really smartly, but that's because, you know, $100 stock goes to 10 and now it's back to 15. Man, that's a 50% gain, but nowhere near where the old highs were. Yeah. And I think investors have kind of woken up to like, we need to see profits. It can't be just about growing our user base and, you know, not being profitable. I think profitability yeah. is important in this new high, high interest rate environment. Yeah. Well, I, I think again, Go back to your old dividend discount model. When, when your required return is one or two percent because interest rates are zero, boy, that gives you a lot of room um, to bid up long duration assets. Now rates are up, cost of capital is up, uh, and you know what? Valuation never goes out of style. It can hibernate for a while, but it never goes out of style. And I would say that applies to uh, profitability as well. The lack of profitability can go out of style sometimes when the market gets really heady. But um, I wouldn't bet the I wouldn't bet the ranch that 
profitability doesn't matter through the fullness of, of an economic cycle or a market cycle. And we, when we saw that, we saw that firsthand. So we like to ask all of our guests the following standard closing question. And that is based on your experience in the markets, if you could teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? I would have them read chapters nine and chapters 20 of Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investing. Um, chapter nine talks about, um, I believe it's chapter nine, talks about um, the market, Mr. Market. It talks about accepting market volatility and using that volatility not to instruct you, but to serve you. I mentioned that a little earlier. The other chapter talks about margin of safety. Just because somebody talks about margin of safety in their investment process doesn't mean they're automatically a value investor. Um, you can't just buy pieces of paper because they are the market darlings. There's an underlying business there. And you have to understand that price is what you pay, but value is what you get. And that's margin of safety. I think uh, every CFA needs to sign off on a waiver every year to keep their CFA outside of paying their dues that they've read and reread chapters nine and chapters 20 of the of the uh, of the, the the first edition of uh, the original edition of the of uh, uh, the intelligent investor where we have strayed from either of those is where we've made our biggest mistakes over the past uh, three decades. Great stuff, Dave. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.